Hey, you are listening to the Grumpy Guy BJJ Podcast. Hey, what's up, guys? Got to take care of a few things before we jump into this week's episode. First, our Ramping Isometrics for BJJ program. It is a 12-week program all laid out for you. It's going to help you build strength and cardio in the fastest, safest, and most convenient way possible. This is how James and I have been training for the past year, and we love it. So we put this program together so you can just follow along, and we are certain you will see and feel the benefits that we do. It's only 15 bucks. Just go to GrumpyGuyBJJ.com, click the drop-down menu in the upper right-hand corner, and you'll find it. Next, R3. Is, this is our K2 D3 supplement. It is a combination, combination of those two vitamins, D3 and K2. These are two vitamins that James and I have been taking for a long time that really help us recover from hard training sessions. And for only 15 bucks with free shipping, you get a whole month's supply. I was going to pull up some studies explaining the benefits of D3 and K2, but I'm not going to insult your intelligence and pretend to be a fucking scientist. I take it. It helps me recover. That's it. So for 15 bucks, check it out. And last, but certainly not least, we have partnered up with Dejitsu.com. They have a ton of awesome BJJ instructionals, and they have hooked us up with a discount code for our listeners. It's Grumpy10. So what you got to do is you go to Dejitsu.com, which is D-I-G-I-T-S-U.com. Find the instructionals you want, throw them in a shopping cart, in the little discount code box, you type in Grumpy10, which is just G-R-U-M-P-Y, and the number 10. One zero. That's it. No spaces. Boom. You get 10% off. You're up and running. They got a nice app you can download on your phone. That way you can take your instructions right to the gym with you. Watch the technique. Drill it. It's a pretty sweet setup. So once again, D-I-G-I-T-S-U dot com. Discount code Grumpy10, G-R-U-M-P-Y-1-0. Simple as that. To find all this stuff I just got done talking about, go to our website, GrumpyGuyBJJ.com. Click the drop-down menu in the upper right-hand corner. There, you'll subscribe to our newsletter for podcast updates. You'll find links for the Ramping ISOs program, the R3 Recovery Supplement, and then under the Programs and Products tab, you'll find a link to Dejitsu.com. And let's be honest, if you guys can't figure out how to navigate a website by now, there's nothing I can do to help you. So quit fucking around, check it out, train hard, and let's get into this week's episode. Three and boom. Back again. We're back once again. All right. So, uh, Sunday podcast. Sunday morning podcast. Late morning podcast. Yes. This is our last podcast with Independent Rob. It is. Yes. Tomorrow. It is. This is my last day of independence. I'm back to sucking the man's teeth tomorrow. <laughs> it's all right, man. You know? It's been a good run. You're, you're responsible, dude. So, doing what you got to, but mm-hmm. hopefully, might have planted some seeds somewhere in there you never know it's like we were talking about yesterday right like hotep jesus was talking about manifesting your destiny so like if you don't even think about it and you don't even like have it anywhere in your head that there's even a possibility that you could find something that you could offer the world that would be worth enough to be able to do it independently uh then you never see it you gotta you know? think about it to make it happen. Yeah, those opportunities, they may be there and you're just not seeing them because you just haven't looked at it that way. So that's mm-hmm. uh, in some way, man, I'll, I'll bet you're, you'll never look at the world the same way again and it might result in some interesting things for you. So you're fucking 40 years old. Where are you going to be in 10 years? I know. So I, know I, try, I try to figure that out. I try to like project out and think about that. I can't. I, I don't have a clear picture to be yeah. honest with you, I really don't. Yeah, yeah. Like, I don't either. But like, you, I get to the point where, yeah, like I don't, you know, when I'm younger, you project out to like 20 or 30, maybe even 40, and you can kind of see it. But then, yeah, man, trying to project out, like, dude, where am I going to be when I'm 60? Uh-huh. Like, holy shit, I don't even, I have no idea. But uh, I definitely know that I didn't want to be uh, flipping burgers or something like that <laughs> at 60. So, it's, um, anyways, we're joined by the podcast mutt. What's up, Aka? <clears throat> Aka got a good run in today. Took him for a bike ride. 
Exactly. See, he seems pretty chill. Like he burnt some energy this morning. Yeah, yeah. The um, PBR is uh, the name of one of the trails out there. It stands for pumps, berms, and rollers. But it's is that the one that's kind of like all? If you start at the far end of it, it's like almost all downhill. Yeah, almost you all. You really downhill. don't even have to even pedal unless you want to haul ass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Like if you wanted to coast the whole thing, you, you could. Much yeah. yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's actually one of my challenges I do. Because it's not easy to not pedal. Right. I mean, to literally not pedal. Like, once you get started, to not pedal at all again, just use nothing but pumping and and technique and stuff to get free it's speed. Kind of it is pretty, it's not easy. And, and if you fuck up, it takes a little bit of luck. Because if you fuck up in one section, because there's sections where you're almost coming to a standstill. Like, you're like, get to that next little roller. <laughs> yes, okay, got some more speed to work with now. And, um, but yeah, no, that's it. That one's fun. But yeah, Aka just hauls ass down that, wears himself out. So. When you guys go out there and ride that, do you do it a couple times? Because it's not a very long trail, right? No, it's not long. We just went out there once today. Okay. But usually when I go out to 18 Road, I'm looking for easy miles. And 18 Road is an easy mile. So I'm not putting in big, you know, I'm not out there for like two, three hours. And, uh, cause there's no like really big sustained climbs mm-hmm. out there and you're not coming out of the car and immediately going up a climb. Like all the other trails around here, you're pretty much grinding yeah, your face like, off. There's almost zero warm up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it's the like, distance from uh, the car to the edge of the trail. Yes. And then that, and it's like, shh, climb. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then and there's, you know, sustained climbs and more of them. And so, yeah, but 18 row is just nice, easy chill so i was uh my recovery score was a little low this morning and uh yeah we we're just looking for something easy to do so that was a good it's a good route it's what makes it so much fun riding around here because you got so much different like difficulty you know. levels yeah yeah yeah. you want something easy you got to 18 road you want something like super technical and difficult you can go out to lunch loops you want to put in a, a big day uh like four plus hours you can go out to loma and they're all like fucking 20 minutes or so from my house. So it's kind of fucking crazy. <laughs> I forget. Yeah, because you take it for granted, you know, if you don't think about it or use it. A little bit, yeah. You, you can. You yeah, could. you could. If you, if you weren't mindful about it. It's like, dude, this is like, if I was a surfer, this is like finding yeah. the perfect surf spot, you know. And uh, yeah, when it's fucking six foot and glassy out there, I want to get out there and ride. So you can just pick, take your pick. What do you feel like doing today? And that's just the three main trail systems. I mean, you got Rabbit Valley, which has a ton of shit. You've got all the stuff out in Palisade. You've got some of the stuff up further in Banks Canyon. So, I mean, there's just like trails everywhere around here. But that's why there's so much mountain bikers, like so many mountain bikers coming here now to visit. And uh, Do you notice a lot more people on the trails nowadays? Then from when you first moved oh, here? Oh, dude, when I first moved here? Yeah. I mean, I can be like the crotchety old dude. Cause, dog, dude, doing the math, I realized I've been here for almost 14 years. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, it's long enough to see some significant changes. And uh, the big one is lunch loops. Like, lunch loops went from, dude, a tiny dirt lot with no bathroom. Yeah. No one ever went out there. When I first moved here, it was still open to Jeeps. You could drive your fucking Jeep up the, the Tabawash Road. And most people shied away from it because it was pretty technical. Super technical. Because, I mean, I was right. I rode quite a bit when I first moved here. I mean, I was terrible. I never, yeah. I never took it serious and I learned the skill of it. And, yeah, going out there, it was it was fucking rough go. Dude, it's, that's it's, some of the rockiest, most technical trails yeah. in all of Colorado, which is saying something. And, uh, yeah, and, but yeah, it's, uh, and no one would go out there. It was great. You could go out there. I remember going out there on Friday afternoon and it was like me and one other car in the parking lot. And, uh, and then they fucking expanded the lot and put in a shitter. And they got that little. <laughs> yeah. The skills part kind of came skills, after that. That skills. was, that was just kind of part of the growth of it. But what it was is you put in a part, you pave a parking lot and put in a shitter and it is amazing how many more people just start showing up. That's what I'm worried about, uh, Mount Garfield, that hike. Yeah. You know, it's a real beautiful steep hike we have here by us. And it's it's a tough fucking hike. It's yeah. two miles, one way, you gain 2,000 feet in elevation. It's no joke. And right now, it's the directions to get there aren't real clear. Right. The parking lots, is you got to go under this sketchy little highway underpass type thing. 
that gets filled with water if there's any rain, and the parking lot's just kind of shitty. And uh, our buddy Nate, and he was talking about, you know, he's privy to that they might be doing a project up there and yep. putting in at, like a rest stop, basically. No. A big parking lot and bathroom and a whole night. Oh, yeah, dude. And I, would do this. I wonder what's going to happen because I've seen so many tourists not be able to do that hike because they don't understand what they're getting themselves into. Right. And that, I've even, I've, I've actually helped quite a few tourists out and I've also pissed quite a few off. Like I'll be coming down off of it and I'll see some, somebody in like sandals or fucking cowboy boots walking up to the base of this hike and I'll stop them. I'm like, Hey, uh, I don't know if you really know what you're about to get yourself into. You know, it just, you know, some old age, some fat, yeah. super fat person that's obviously not very physical. I'm like, this hike is t- it's really tough. I don't yeah. think you should just, this isn't just your walk in the park. And I had a couple of tourists be like, really? I'm like, yeah, it's, you don't have the right footwear. I was like, you were going to hate life in about 10 minutes up that first climb. And then stop and turn around. But I had some people get pissed off at me. Like, oh, fuck you. What, you think You think because we don't live here, we can't hike this? And I'm like, I'm sorry, man. I'm just, I was just trying to help. Yeah, like, yeah. Have at it. Like, and you see them like, have, like, 15 minutes in, they haven't made it up the first steep part. They're fucking, and it's so steep, they they don't feel comfortable walking back down. So then they're on their butt trying to slide back down the dirt. It's it's a shit show. Yeah. Anyways, that's okay. funny, man. Yeah, no, it'll be, it will definitely change things. That that is one thing I've learned is you pave the lot and mm-hmm. put in a freaking shitter, and just way more people come. I don't know what it is. Mm-hmm. And then they started like promoting. You know, more come to Fruta and mountain biking and come to... Then Junction, actually, when I first moved here, Fruta was, like, the town. And then Junction got in on the action. They started really trying to promote, like, Grand Junction mountain biking and doing some races and series and stuff like that. So, and then, yeah, they put in the Skills Park. Oh, and then the uh, um, fucking Born to Run came out in that time, too. I got to remember... When Born to Run came oh, out, the book, the book yeah, all of a sudden, yeah, yeah. it's like, where did all these motherfucking runners come from? All of a sudden, it, you just have all these people out there, and they're freaking thinking they're Tarumaru Indians, man, and they're fucking <laughs> minimalist shoes being trail runners. And they're, and they're five-finger shoes. Yeah, man, and it was <laughs> they were nowhere to be seen before that goddamn book came out. And then it came out, and all of a sudden, it was like, what the fuck is going on here? Because... Uh, Lunch Loops is right across from that. There's a, a neighborhood right on the other side of the hill. So there's actually quite a few people that live super close to that trailhead. So, but when it was a small trailhead and, you know, trail running wasn't cool and it was just mountain bikers and it was fuck, yeah, it was a totally different scene. And so now you've got, you know, your, your weekend warrior, oh, I'm coming to town. I'm going to go check out Lunch Loops. Uh, fucking setting up shop with his RV and shit in the big parking lot and then yeah everybody's out a bunch of trail runners and stuff so yeah it's uh lunch loops can be a bit of a shit show and then along with you know trail runners and uh um, hikers come dogs and, mm. and you know we've talked about that a bunch man like people are such idiots with their dogs it's like man like that dog can get seriously hurt if not killed if it's just running along and a, a and a rider get tangled up. Dude, that, you can get really fucked up if you're hoping. Yeah, I can get fucked up. And a dog comes blazing out of nowhere. And yeah, you crash into it like you're gonna eat shit. Yes, it's dangerous. If it's a good sized dog, it's right? dangerous. Yeah, it's right? really, it is very dangerous. Yeah, and so we're all trying to share the trails there, which means that like you know, riders have a right to like you know, yes, there's uh, we need to yield to hikers and stuff like that. But your fucking dog is not you. So, like, expecting riders to yield to your fucking dog is ridiculous. And, uh, anyway, so, luckily if you get a little bit out, like, about 15 minutes in, you're outside of most of the hikers and, you know, even a lot of the trail runners tend to stick within, like, you know, 15, 20 minutes of the parking lot and just hit those trails. So, you can still get out there and get lost a little bit. That's good. It is good, man. It's not Southern California. Like, that's, you know, goddamn, dude. Riding out I can't, there. I can't even see that being fun. It's not fun. It's not fun. Like, it, if that's all that you know and that's right. all that you have, then yeah, it's fun. But having to stop every five minutes or less for a hiker or 
just because there's so many motherfuckers or, or someone riding up or down or like running into other trail users just constantly is uh that's no fun for mountain it's no biking fun, man it's, it just it kind of takes part of a big part of the way you getting out there and getting away from people yeah like running or hiking it's not as big a deal but yeah like mountain biking you want to like be able to get some flow going yeah. just get some i'm i'm going here and uh, yeah, if you're constantly having to run into people, it sucks. It does suck, man. It does suck. It's like going to a ski resort on the weekend, dude. You go to, I mean, any of the any of the resorts around here on the weekend get a sh- they turn into a shit show, especially the main lifts. Yeah, you know, closest to the you know base of the mountain, anywhere on the mountain, but close to the easier runs and closer to the base on the weekends. Jesus Christ, dude, it is fucking terrible. Breckenridge. Is probably the worst. I don't know why. In my opinion, I, I don't. I haven't like researched the numbers, of, like how many total skiers they get every day. But, right, right. Dude, there is. You try to go there on a Friday or Friday. Fridays get busier, but they're not terrible. You definitely, if you go there on a Saturday or Sunday, holy fuck, dude, you would be dumbfounded at the size of the lift lines. Like, it, like, That's what? Keystone, right? Uh, or are they they're different? The same area. They're different. Okay. okay in, in that, in that, what is that? Summit County. Yeah. I think. You have, you got A Basin, Keystone, Breckenridge, okay. and then Vale and Beaver Creek. Oh, yeah, for, yeah, that's yeah, kind yeah. of the order from like east to west down Valley. Okay. Um, yeah, dude, it's it's a fuck. it's, I won't go to Breckenridge. <laughs> I won't fucking touch What's it. What's crazy man. is like, you're not the only person who knows this, and yet people still fucking go and yeah. stand in those lines, and it, I, I just don't understand it either, but... Yeah, it gets. Uh, Do you see that with mountain biking too? Because they've got mountain bike or the ski resorts open to riding, and uh, yeah, on the weekends, man, it is just a shit show. Does it get that busy for mountain biking? Holy fuck, yes! And, and a lot of it is because uh, they rent bikes too, oh, so you'll get people coming who want to try this downhill mountain biking thing, and so they're like, you know, they're renting a bike and getting all the gear. And it's a whole industry, man. And they get them out there doing skills lessons with people who don't know what the fuck they're talking about. And, uh, you know, literally, they're like, hey, Johnny, you look like you can ride a bike real quick or, or pretty good. You, you want to be a coach this season and, and help these people? Like, that's literally how these fucking coaches at these resorts are picked out. It's like, you look like you can ride pretty good. We can teach you how to teach people. <laughs> Not even that. Like, you must know what you're doing. Like, it is literally the... Mountain biking is the uh, like the epitome of in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. And it's like, dude, if you can, if you are even a half-ass rider, man, like you must know what you're doing. Like you are heads and shoulders above most people out there who just absolutely suck at, at riding a bike from a technical standpoint. And it's like so easy to get to be a skills coach. Dude, it's like a two-stripe two stri- two blue belt. Like a, it, It's like if you looked out in the fucking jiu-jitsu landscape and, and it was just two-stripe blue belts everywhere, running schools, putting out instructionals, like basically running the show and, and being like the authority in, in uh, jiu-jitsu training. Like, it'd be like that. It's frightening. It's fucking frightening. It's frightening. Like the advice is not only wrong, it's like dangerous. You know, and it is literally like that. You have fucking a bunch of two stripe blue belts in a world of white belts. And dude, you know, you know, like if you're a white belt, a fucking blue belt seems like a god. Right. You think they know what they're doing. Compared to you, they are amazing. And especially if you've never run into a black belt, like a legit black belt. Like, man, you could think like a fucking, you know, good blue belt, decent purple belt is like the shit. And you have, like, that is. The mountain biking world is full of those type of riders who just live in an area where there's no black belt. So there's no comparison. It's like, like the old days of jiu-jitsu. It's like the old days of jiu-jitsu, man. Like if you don't know any better, like a two-stripe blue belt can open a school. Especially if there's no other black belts in the area. There's no one else around who's better than them. Like, yeah. And I, like, that is exactly what the fuck is going on, man. It is, it's frightening. But yeah, it's a whole industry, man. The whole downhill, like lift access, uh, bike park thing. And it's all, they call them flow trails, which basically means they're like giant 10, 15 foot wide. They're basically like, uh, like Jeep roads, you know? And they'll have like some little features on the side here and there if you want to try something. But you can basically just rent a big ass bike, 
take some skills lessons from some dumbass, and then just ride down these green trails, or you know, some of them get into blue, but, but there's no no features, nothing hard at all to challenge you. You're just riding downhill on this big ass bike that's doing all the work, and and it's like yay, and it's like fuck, you know, on some level it's hard. It's like look, I know you're having fun, but you'd have more fun if you knew what you were doing. You know, yeah, that was part of the reason why I got out of mountain biking. Is dude, I would, you know, it's weird. You know, looking back at it, and just as, as as I was listening to you talk, like there was, dude, there was very little talk. I, I had a couple buddies that I ride with, and they were better than I was. And then again, I was like a white belt that didn't know how to time a belt. And I mean, I don't know how good these guys were to me. Right? They were they were better than I was, but there was still like very little talk of technique or anything. Yeah, that's a newer. Yeah, there, there, yeah. Was, there was none of that. Yeah, you know, if you ten years ago, it was not as big. Yeah, a deal. that's about what it was. Yeah, and, and looking back, if there would have been somebody like, "Hey, man, let me help you. Let me show you how to get over this rock." Right. I'm sure. Yeah. There was there was none of that. It was yeah. just Fucking pedal your face. Was, off. But you see, like, there. but you would have been like, "Oh, cool. Now show me." Right. And now you got some two stripe blue belt who doesn't know any better, showing you what he thinks is the right technique. But at least it would have been better than not. Anybody showing me. Maybe. Maybe, yeah. Maybe. Depends on how fucked up my information was getting. Right. I mean, but it's... It, yeah, that's what I'm saying, though. Like, if, if the information they're giving you is not only wrong, but it's dangerous, like, would you have been better off just continuing to be in a space to learn yourself? Like, sometimes having somebody coach you and coach you wrong is worse because sure. you will learn how to do it right eventually. Like, you, your brain is the ultimate problem-solving machine. Like, you keep presenting it with the with the problem and in the right environment to solve it in and it will fucking figure it out. So, you know, that's, uh, I, I, I do, I personally think, especially mountain biking, like most riders would be way better off, like not getting coaching. Like just, uh, like the best thing that happened to me is when I started riding, I didn't get into mountain biking. I got a mountain bike to commute to work. I kind of got into mountain bike in the back door. I went, you know, started riding cause I was bored on the weekend. It's like, Oh, I like this mountain biking thing. And so I didn't have any friends who are mountain bikers. You know, a lot of people get into it that way. Like they have friends who are mountain bikers and they're like, hey, come ride with us, you know? And so if you get into it, well, now you've got this group and they're telling you what to think. They're telling you how to, what gear to buy. They're trying to help you. You know, just like we do with new white belts, we're trying to give you advice to help you, right? But you have this group who's, who's pushing you along the way. So it's just like, you know, if you start off at some crazy 10th planet place where they're teaching you rubber guard right off the bat, right? You know what I mean? Like they're, 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 they're doing, they're trying to help you out, but they're really doing you a disservice. are they really doing you a disservice by teaching you this stuff without realizing, you know, what they're, what they're, uh, um, teaching you. So, um, yeah, man, it's, uh, it's, I, I, and see, I, yeah, I think that most riders would do better which is fucking figuring out on their own. But that was what I did because I didn't have any, uh, like I said, I didn't have that group. So I would just go out by myself. And I and this is before the internet too, thank fucking God. Because, <laughs> before the internet. Yeah, well, I mean, the internet was, was like there. Before time, right? It, you know what I mean? It but it wasn't time, like it was now. now. Yeah, it wasn't. And, and the, the amount of uh, just armchair experts was just nowhere near the same. And so, you know, I didn't have that information. I didn't have people telling me what to do. So a lot of it was just, going out there and trying to pick it apart and figure it out myself. And like, I mean, you know me, I just have that mind. So like, I'm analytically like thinking about this shit. I remember watching videos and like rewinding and watching like the crash sections versus like where they clean stuff and be like, okay, he crashed here. Like what was different? What was different with his body position? You know, what did he do different? And trying to analyze that shit. And again, looking back now, I realize that's not normal. No, it's not. And, uh, but I was, I didn't know that. And so I, and I didn't have the group doing that for me and telling me that I shouldn't do that. So it was like, yeah, not having that influence early on was probably the best thing that ever happened to me because I was able to figure some shit out on my own. And then when I started hanging out with the writers and they're telling me stuff, I'm like, man, that's weird. Cause I just, my experience does not back that up. Like the whole clipless pedal thing. Like by the time I started hanging out with people who were, you know, really pushing that I should get on clipless pedals, I'd have enough time riding flats to be like, I just, my experience is different than what you're telling me. Like, I seem to be able to keep my feet on my pedals. I seem to be able to climb just fine. Like, all these things that you tell me that I can't do on flats, I seem to be able to do. So, I'm going to go with that. 
And uh, did you ever ride flipless pedals? Dude, I did. I tried. Uh, um, I tried them out, and <clears throat> it was because the trails that I started riding in Santa Barbara were uh, they were they were like lunch loopy, mm-hmm. um, and you know technical and rocky. So not where you want to learn to ride flipless puddles. <laughs> in fact, I mean, you go out and ride lunch loops, and you'll notice a much higher percentage of people out there ride flats. Like here in Junction, we have a much higher percentage of riders that ride flats, and you'll find in a lot of areas because we have super technical trails with rocks where the consequences are much higher if you can't get them clipped and so just like survival instinct starts to kick in with more people and uh and they um you know migrate to flats but i bought into it so i tried the whole clipless pedal thing but the thing is i tried i had to be able to get in and out of them so i would i would ride them to work and then i would practice uh in a grass area just clipping and unclipping and i could never get my left foot comfortable with unclipping and so i was never like really comfortable with taking them on the trail and just committing to going down a rocky trail with my feet it seemed like fucking idiocy like suicide (laughs) and uh especially because i knew i could ride fine with flats you know what i mean it's not like i wasn't having fun and it's not like i was just completely helpless without my feet being attached to the pedals it was like you know okay i'm doing okay here and then i had my proverbial my my famous moment is bike james uh, where I fell over. I was riding with Kiela and I fell over at a stop sign because mm-hmm. I couldn't get unclipped. Yep. And I was like... This is stupid. Yeah, this is stupid. Well, you know what? It was funny because somebody drove by and laughed at me. Yep. And I'm sitting here with my future wife who I've just started dating looking up at me. I'm sitting here looking at myself and I'm thinking like, dude, I knew I had to stop. I still couldn't get my foot out. If this had been the trail, I was thinking of one section in particular where I really would have gotten hurt. Bad. Go tumbling down the side. If of the this would have happened, well, I would have slammed into some fucking rocks. Yeah. You know, like that's the that's the the thing that people don't think about is it's it's like you not being able to get your feet underneath you means that you're just going to take the full brunt of whatever you're slamming into with your upper body, and that is not that like hurts. yes, your upper body is not really made to do that. You're made to get your legs or a leg underneath you and help offset, absorb, deflect things like that. Like, dude, your upper body. And the higher up the upper body you go <laughs> to your shoulders and your head slamming into the ground, like the more dangerous it gets, man, the worse it gets. So yeah, I was like, fuck this shit. Like this is stupid. I'm having way more fun on flats. I'm just gonna ride those until I know that it's my pedals that are holding me back, and then I'll switch. And like yeah, that was That day never came. The day never came, man. That it literally never came. I, I I kept riding and I kept getting better and I was like if somebody was faster than me, it was like, they're a better rider than me. Like, I never ran into, like, my doppelganger who was kicking my ass Dude, because he was, was clipped in. Yeah. That was never the case. It was like, I, I ran into better riders who were clipped in, but they weren't better because they were clipped in. They were just better riders. And, you know, it's just, it's hard for people because when you get a situation where the vast majority of people in the sport, specifically professionals, do it a certain way it's really easy to just point to that and say like, well, you know, like that's all the thinking you have to do. Like, cause they did all the thinking for me. They wouldn't be doing this if they hadn't thought this out already. Therefore, I don't need to think about it. I just need to point to them and say they're doing it. So that's why. And it's like, dude, that is not like, well, I remember when I, the first time I bought like, to me, it was an expensive mountain bike and ice one. It was back in like 2000, 2001. You know, it got me the old specialized rock hopper or whatever, yeah. whatever. And that was, you know, back then it was, I think I dropped like 1500 bucks on it or yeah. something in that ballpark. And I remember at the bike shop, this was back in Michigan. I mean, it was just like, oh, you're spending the money on this bike. Like, yeah, you just get clipless, clipless pedals. puddles. There was, there was no question about it. Yeah. Like, oh, like, cause I, I never rolled on clipless pedals. I was like, how the fuck do these things work? Okay. And they give me like a three minute tutorial. <laughs> yep. Like, yeah, like, oh, you're, you're dumb. Because I think at that time, Seems like yeah, my bike it came with you know some cheap plastic flats on there. Yeah, the bikes the didn't. They, probably, they don't come with puddles. They don't even come with puddles right. anymore. But you, I, I remember these ones actually came with some. Cheap they usually plastic. have like some cheap like plastic stand-ins, but so, you're, right. they're intended for you if you buy a high end bike. The intention is for you to buy a pair right. of pedals with the bike. They're not included with the bike. That okay? Yeah, so that pair. I, of, I don't know if this bike was nice enough to qualify that category. Yeah, they all are. Uh, yeah, right. once, once you kind of get up into a certain like like $1,500, $2,000 range, 
that tends to be the, the norm. Because well, everybody has their preference for clipless pedals. Because yeah. you've got Shimano, you've got you know time and speed play, and and you know so it, if they spec a pedal on there and you buy it and you prefer a different uh, or um, pedal, and a lot of times people have their own pedals already. You know what I mean? So if you've already bought five hundred dollar pedals and shoes. Like that's what you're using on your new bike. You're not gonna switch that. Fucking shoes you wear in those things. Oh my god! Hard as like, they're worse than bowling shoes. Oh yeah. They're fucking ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even if you can get your foot out and put it down on something, they're slippery as shit. Right. And it's narrow. And your your foot can't work right. You're you're like your foot's in a hard fucking cast. Yeah. And so you gotta put your foot down. Your leg slides out anyways. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, It's it's wild, man. It is literally the like the emperor's new clothes come to life where. Everyone out there thinks it's ridiculous, but they look around and everybody else is doing it and no one else seems to be noticing or saying anything about it. So they think they're the only ones, right? Like, I'm sure you probably had that feeling. It's like, everyone else is, seems to be having no problem with this. This must be the right thing. This must be the right thing and it must be me. Like, I'm the one that has the problem, right? It's not like, you know, these fucking pedals are insane and stupid. Does anybody else feel this way? Because if you say that... Everyone's like, no, no, no man, you you're got, an idiot. You just, you just gotta get used to him. You just yeah. haven't fallen enough. Yeah. You know, like you just haven't fucking gotten good enough about taking your foot out. And it's just, it's like, whoa, yeah, it's a, uh, it is a wild, wild psychology that uh, goes on there. But part of it, because there's nothing really that I can think of that you can point to in like the jujitsu world and say like this is like clipless puddles, because there's science that says that it's bullshit. There's real world examples that says that it's bullshit. There's movement principles that says that it's bullshit. And yet it continues to exist because there's never a time when it comes up against like the mat. Like we talk about this, man. Like you can tell me your theory on how this move is going to work all day long. But when we're going to slap hands at some point and you're going to slap hands with other people at some point and we're going to be able to test and see does this work and if it doesn't you know making it but it's like it's clear there's no there's no debate and it's so fuzzy with uh there's no true just like test test just you know that that is uh intellectually unforgiving that um that you can use to really point to and say look man this is bullshit and this is what's really going on. And so you just live in this world where people feel they want this to be true so badly. They've emotionally invested in it so badly. Dude, I was thinking about this the other day. It's kind of like with kettlebells, right? Like, cause it, So say you're an RKC guy, right? And so or even a strong first. Like Those certifications aren't cheap. Are they still going on? Do they still yeah. do those? Is oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, you're talking like what? Like two... Grand plus yeah. twenty five hundred dollars. Yeah, I went through kettlebell sir back in two thousand. Oh no, take that. Sorry, two thousand seven, two thousand six, right before I moved out here. Yeah, and I dropped fifteen hundred bucks, man. Yeah, I think the American Kettlebell Club. It was more like a sport kettlebell, yep. kettlebell thing. But anyways, anyways, yeah. yeah so, so they're not cheap, right? Yeah. And so you know, let's say two grand, and then you have to get recertified yep. every couple years. Yep. And so even if they cut you a deal, so you know, you get like. You, you know, five, six, seven years in the training with kettlebells and, and you've gotten your RKC certification and you've kept it, man, you've dropped like five, six plus thousand dollars on being an RKC kettlebell guy. Like you are emotionally and financially, financially invested so hard in being a kettlebell guy that like it's almost impossible to get you to not be. Yep. Most people, it's almost impossible for to get most people to not be to back off of that stance and go, "Oh, wait a minute. I may have done something wrong here." And like it made me realize like I joke about it. Like I have no current certifications. My job is to be the the um smartest, least qualified guy in the room. <laughs> That's my goal. And so, like, I, I never, you know, finished college, so I don't have a degree. I, I got no current certifications that I can point to. And I never chased those certifications. I never chased that stuff. And I realized it was such a blessing 
because it made me, I could be flexible. I wasn't financially invested in being X. And so when something new comes along, it's easy for me to be like, oh, oh it might be better. Let's try it out. I'll go try that out yeah. because I haven't spent $10,000 being a kettlebell guy. Mm-hmm. And now I have to like go back on all of that. It's so. Because you feel like you wasted your time, your like money. You money. So you yep. like, nope, I'm just going to plant yes. my flag in the sand here. It's here. Defend it. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, it's uh, interesting. Same thing with the jiu-jitsu world, man. You get fucking like. You know, you get invested in one system too much and it can come back to haunt you because you, you become inflexible at a certain point because yes, supporting the, theory, the system yeah. becomes part of what you're about. And uh, not actually the best technique or the right. best principles to yeah, apply yeah. to that situation. Yeah. Speaking of that and kind of like workout stuff, I've been kind of nerding out on is, you know, stick mobility type stuff. Okay. I want to get one of those things, man. Dude, I. There's something there, man, that I really think it's underutilized. I mean, even just a broomstick. Yeah. You can just use you know, a broomstick. But, you know, the stick mobility for people. When I say stick mobility, I'm not actually referencing, like, those big orange sticks. Yeah. But I do use them. Right. You know, that's, I like the orange stick. There's something to that orange stick. You can do some things with that. You can't do with, a, yeah. with, a, with like, a PVC pipe or yep. wooden Be, or Because of the flex to it. Yeah. It really, you know, it's... Like getting into some some certain positions and like using like end range isometrics with that stick, really applying some force to it in an extended position or flex position, dude. I've been like I said, just this past couple of weeks, I've been nerding out on watching more videos yeah. and trying different you know different things because you know it's when it comes to like your mobility or strength training, basically you're trying to because when you do a sport, there's repetitive things you do constantly. So when you're working on your mobility shit, you should be kind of trying to counter, aid yourself, but also fix the damage you're doing in your yep. sport. Because sports yeah, can yeah. damage. Yep. So, man, dude, I, that, there's something to those sticks, dude. Yeah. I, gotta, I gotta learn more. And, yeah. And I want to, I'm trying to educate myself more on them. Just basically what I mean by that is just using them. You know, trial and error. Trying yeah. stuff, you know, putting together a little, like a flow or mobility routine with it. Yeah. And then I really gotta like try teaching it to somebody and seeing what they think about it. Right, and, yeah. And I've been, do, just nerding out on them lately, man. Like, I think there's something there. It's kind of yeah. like untapped, dude. That's, I think so, too. It's, uh, I use it a lot, actually. I mean, I, I say a lot. I've been using the band mobility, like, a ton. But I do the stick mobility as well. And, um, yeah, there's, there's definitely something there, like, connecting the left and the right side of the body because that you know the the tension you're creating through the stick kind of connects them yeah and then you're getting this like a lot of times you're getting a, a push pull action because of that that you're not able to get without that connection and that that push pull like you're saying like you know you're, you're really isometrically creating tension with one side and that actually allows you to get deeper into the stretch on the other side um, yeah that's a huge like stability is a huge factor in mobility. And uh, so, yeah, that's, I, I, I agree, man. I, I like those things. I've been using them. I went to that, when I went to the, uh, the Perform Better thing in Long Beach um, last year. Yeah, they were there. The stick mobility guys were there. And they were doing a few things that I, I was like, yeah, okay, there's something there. So, yeah, I've been playing around with that, using it on a pretty regular basis. Well, see, I have the one, I got one six foot, you know, the big orange stick. Yeah. And I actually, like I said, it's just been, oh, maybe three weeks now that I've been nerding out on it more. Just really been watching more videos and experimenting with myself. Yeah. And I actually bought another six footer and a four footer. Okay. So I got, I'll have three sticks at home. I can, you know, I'll bring one out to borrow it if you want or something. Yeah, but, yeah. Dude, that's, there's something there, man. Yeah. Like, there's something there. I want to get good enough with them or feel comfortable enough to where I can explain it and feel the benefits of it. And that way, I can take some guinea pigs like a grumpy yeah. class. Yeah, man, I will. I will tell you um, from experience that. Uh, um, God, I don't know how to put this. You're you have a very high level of, of uh, body awareness and your movement vocabulary is really good, and so you're an outlier that way. And you don't think it will be, but dude, that's. The stick, because you're basically asking people to do opposites. It's almost like pat your head and rub your stomach. Mm-hmm. Okay, I need you to, and, and it, it's to get them to have to connect both sides through that stick. 
is not as easy as you think. Like, because you have done so much prerequisite shit up to this point, like literally decades of it before you're starting to nerd out on this, that I, 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 I made this mistake. I tried to use the stick mobility with some people and found out really quickly that, um, God, it taxes their brain and movement capabilities so that it becomes something else. Really? Yes. And you, so you find, I mean, cause you're a good coach and you find it hard to coach somebody with that. So yeah. If they're so, not. Some of the upper body movements, right? Like some of the lower body stuff where you're just kind of, you know, leaning into it and stretching. But so, so some of the like static position stuff mm -hmm. that you're using the stick to get a little deeper into. Yeah. You, that, that's, you know, not super tough. But man, you start getting people to try to like swing in their arms and doing the things and stuff like that, and and you'd uh, um, you'd be surprised. So yeah, I don't, you know, I would. Uh, it 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 made me rethink like buying a bunch of sticks to throw in the grumpy guy class. Well, yeah, that's way down the road. That's long goal. Like I, right. I gotta do, I gotta do a lot of experimenting, and that was. I could of, be wrong. Like I said, I, I just tried it with a couple people, but yeah, I mean that was kind of you know like the pie in the sky kind of thought yeah. behind it yeah but even you know, if i get good enough and comfortable enough with it slowly just like okay hey man you start slowly finding somebody somewhat physically capable and start with yeah. them start with them and show them like hey i've been playing with this shit you try it and start a training business is that what you're saying well, so look I, at this shit i hadn't really thought look that, at this but. shit <laughs> see i don't know man but that dude yeah. that, like i say that stick dude I look, yeah and then being able to create tension in an end range position is so good yeah. because just getting your body in that position doesn't mean you own it right yeah being and, able uh, to create, being tension, able to create tension and have control in that position yeah dude it feels amazing man i was just i was doing a bunch of shit with it it was yeah it was just no yesterday saturday it was friday because i was a little beat up from my workouts all week i was like all right i don't really need to fucking lift any more weights this week <laughs> <laughs> I went out, I started lifting, I started doing some other shit, and I was like, I just fucking put the barbell away. I was like, all right, dude, let's just do mobility shit today. I'm a little beat up. And I spent like about an hour just fucking around with that thing. Just finding a little video, and it just kind of snowballed. This, dude, I got a hell of a workout. Dude, I was sweating my ass off. Just, yes. It's, it's good. Yeah. It's really good. Well, see, because that, it's, it's, I, it, it brings up something I was thinking about. Because, so you get in those extreme end ranges of motion. And, you know, one, it's about creating tension, but it's also about being able to relax yep. in those positions. And so, and you can feel like literally your nervous system will switch. Like your, your, your sympathetic nervous system will fucking switch on hard when you get into a uh, end range of motion that you're not familiar with and not comfortable with. And so you're literally, that's like when you start sweating and it's it's literally your nervous system is switched over to this flight or flight response because into your brain like this position is a dangerous position to be in and so it's trying to protect you and get you the fuck out of there and so you literally have to switch that's where the breathing comes in yep. because you know like uh what was it Laird um was talking on Joe Rogan talking about like you know a 7 second inhale forces the body to trigger the the parasympathetic nervous system and take you out of that fight or flight and into the, the rest and relax mode. And so like forcing yourself to slow your breathing down and get those five, six, seven second inhales and exhales, it, it, it teaches the brain, it tells the brain to turn the knob to a different setting while you're in this position. And then now, now that you're there, the ability for you to create, because like at first you're not creating tension, you're creating stiffness. It's tension, but it's not stability. You're creating stiffness, and and stability is your is is, is tension that you can turn on and off as needed. And so what you got to do is get rid of the stiffness through being able to breathe there, and then you want to work on your stability by that isometric contraction. That's your ability to control the tension rather than have that inauthentic stiffness. And so yeah, it was. It's funny, when we were doing Grumpy Guy class, I was thinking about that. I was like, I'd get my in-range of motion or, or something, and I could feel my, you can just feel your chest gets tight, and your breathing gets tight, and, and I was like, dude, my nervous system's in the wrong state right now. Like, this is nervous system training right now. Like, before I can even start to gain mobility or do shit, I have to do something to get my brain to get out of fight or flight 
uh, mode because I'm never gonna fucking accomplish shit this way. So, anyways, yeah, but it's uh, the using the sticks to to f- help facilitate some of that shit. It's I think a good example. I don't know if it's a good example for everybody else, but it is for the conversations we have. Is it's I find it's a really good feedback tool, just like doing deadlifts with the bands on your hip. Yeah. To check in your hinge. Like, okay, that is the end range of my hinge. For me to go lower, I'm starting to do other shit besides hinge. That's yeah, that's been the biggest benefit with that band around the way. So just a cue, just a tactile cue, like, oh, that's it. Yeah. Like, I physically can't hinge any further than that. And just for me to hear the noise of the plates hitting the ground or, you know, getting, in my mind, what is low enough in this hinge, my back's having to move here. Yeah. And using that band has just been so huge. That. And that, the sticks... That's that's kind of what I was discovering the other day when I was fucking around with them, like because it would, like you said, when I'm trying a new position, at first it is just stiffness because my body's like, what is this? What are you asking me to do? How am I creating tension here? So then I come back out of it, and be like, okay. So then and try to get, and eventually you get to the point like, oh, there it is. You kind of find a sweet spot, like, oh, I can get there. I'm not in danger. I can relax. And, then, and once you get to that point. It's fucking amazing. Yeah. And that's kind of when I came. I think, I'm pretty sure that was Thursday. And then, or Friday. And uh, and I was like, that's it. I was like, I got to get it. Because I only have the one six footer. And that's, I went and I jumped on the website. And I bought the number six. Because there's, there's quite a few different moves you can do with two sticks. And be yeah. Helpful, and then a shorter one. So I was like, fuck it. I bought yeah. a six footer. I bought a four footer. I was like, I, Yeah, I got to dig into their library more. I got a very rudimentary routine. Super rudimentary. I mean, it's good. It hits all the like, what I need, but, uh, yeah, I haven't like really dug in and just seen like, Oh wow. That's, you know, I never would have thought of that. Cause I don't sit around with, uh, with two sticks fucking right. thinking about this shit all day long, you know, like that's what those people do. So I know that they've come up with things that, uh, um, yeah, yeah. Cool, man. I'm glad you brought that up. Cause that gives me something to dig into. I can't let you get better than me. Well, that's good. Cause I need, you, you're so analytical and shit. Dude. You've helped me be a better learner when it comes to fucking like jujitsu and everything. Cause of the way your brain thinks, yeah. Cause you're way more analytical than I am. And I thought, I thought about that. And then I sent you that picture of White Belt Rob the other day. Yes. And, you know, what, did you notice in that one, the one picture to where I'm standing with my hand raised? Um, I don't know if you noticed, but the dude I beat, he was like a purple belt or brown belt. If you look, look yeah. at that, look at that picture, I can't, I don't remember, but it was very common back in those days when I first started jiu-jitsu. You go to some of these tournaments, that there would be quite a few, yeah, quite a few. I had not definitely not the size of nowadays. There would be quite a few white belts, some blue belts, but once you get to like purple and above, there would be like nobody for these guys to compete against. And so sometimes they'd ask you, like, hey, you want to do some matches against some of these higher belts? There was many times like, oh fucking, I'd just get molly walk, but. I was a pretty angry dude, and I was I knew enough. <laughs> so I really pissed off some fucking like purple belts, brown belts, and black belts back then. That's funny. And I think that picture I sent you. Yeah. I can't I can't remember if that he was purple or brown, but he was not happy with me because I was playing rough. Like, hey, we're in a fucking sport, you know. It's a tournament, baby. Yeah, but and so that anyways, that kind of got me thinking. Like, you know, because I wasn't, I never was super analytical. I was just it was my anger based jujitsu. Yeah, I, I never pro. I, I mean, I, I knew I had to learn, and technique was important, but not to the level to where you break down shit. Yeah, because you always have to know the why. Even if something works, for, even if you do a technique and get it to work, like for me, like if I do a technique and it works, I almost, if I don't catch myself, I'll just stop thinking about it. I'll just take it on face value. Fuck it, it works. Let's go with it. You will sit down and be like, okay, why'd that work? Did that work because he just fucked up? Or did I have my foot here? Why? Oh, I put my foot here, but then what? Well, for what purpose? What was that? You know, and so you fucking go down that rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, uh. So I find that helps me recognize the position from other positions. You know, like that, that's a lot of why I do that because it's like, if I understand, like, the why behind this technique, you know, if I find myself in something similar and it's like, the same why applies. She's kind of the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All of a sudden, I find myself in the same why. Then I can apply that technique. And so, uh, yeah, that's it, it, it's really a lot of it. Is It's the same thing with like, uh, you know, if I see a workout program. It's like, man, I don't care about the sets and reps and exercises. I want to know why. What is your thought process here? Because I may find myself thinking about somebody's program down the road. And all of a sudden... Oh, okay. That this thought process that I'm going through now is similar to that one that 
that you talked about when you were doing this program. And so now I'm able to like jump into that thought process and see if there's something there. So that's the, that's why I like to get analytical with it because I don't think it's, I'm going to argue with you. I don't think that's it. You, you do like it, but that's just you and you can't help it. No, 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 for sure. For sure. <laughs> there is no like, no, no, no. There is no, that is me. That is you. There's no like, conscious effort to do it. It just it's gonna happen. Dude, I'm, I'm like when you're dude, you watch your. I'm sure you watch like watch your daughter spread spread butter on toast. I can see you just thinking, why is she spreading it that way? She should be holding a knife that way. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I can see you just doing it all the fucking time. Yeah, turn it everything. off sometimes. Yeah. <clears throat> so I don't know. Yeah, for sure. I'm always like thinking, is there a better way to do that? What's the most efficient way to do that? <laughs> so. No, it's uh, it's a blessing and a curse. It is, man. It is. I mean, I did that when I've gotten to bodybuilding. I think I told you this before. Like, while well, you were allegedly sitting in the back of the math class tripping out, I was like trying to figure out different body part splits and <laughs> crazy shit, man. I like again, like again, I look back and it's like that was not normal. I just I thought it was normal. Like, oh, you get into something, you get into it. Like, you want to fucking know how to do it right and uh yeah 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 it, but yeah just that um desire to know why it's i bet you you were an annoying little kid i probably was i bet you drove a lot of adults crazy yeah i can see that probably i can't remember being too annoying <laughs> of course you did <laughs> I thought I was pretty funny. <laughs> I thought I was smart. I thought these fucking adults are so stupid. <laughs> no, well, you know, by the time I hit my teenage years, yeah, I annoyed the piss out of a lot of adults, for sure. For sure. Oh, God, I used to drive the teachers mad. Just, yeah, with the why and just, oh, I just, whatever their position was, I had to take the opposite. I had to fucking argue. I'm not surprised in the least. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, yes, man, every paper it was like, all right, what can I do? What is the fucking... And you're not all the time. Sometimes I just get it done. But yeah, a lot of times I just be in a mood. And be like, all right, what can I say that's going to piss them off? <laughs> I mean, I don't even believe it. I just want to fucking... See if I can argue it. Just yeah. Just feather drop them. Exactly. That does not surprise me at all. Exactly. But yeah. Anyway, so that's why... That's part of, part of why I bring up the stick mobility stuff. Because I know you'll nerd out on it. I know. Possibly if you see me doing it. I'm going to make a note about it. Right now, so I know what to do. I'm sure you have some good insight. It's on my stuff to get done. And list. You, you can help course correct me when I get a little off in the weeds. <laughs> Suck mobility. No, that's not it. Stick mobility. Stick mobility. Suck mobility is something different. <laughs> it might be a different website. <laughs> might be. Make sure I get that one right. It's like hotmail.com. You know, you got to make sure you, you spell mail the right way. <laughs> That'd be a good test for people. Is you take their phone and just type in Hotmail, M-A, and see what auto-populates. Man, if they ain't figured out how to keep shit from popping up in their thing by now, then they deserve whatever they get. Do people still have Hotmail accounts? Is that still a thing? Oh, yeah. Every once in a while I see someone email me from a Hotmail. Dude, every once in a while you see a fucking AOL. Really? Yeah. Yeah, they're still, like, it's still a thing. I don't know that AOL is actually a thing, but those email addresses are so floating huh? around. Yeah. Yep. I know, dude. Every time I see that, I'm like, dude, 1998 called. They want their fucking email address back. Like, that was my first. Hotmail was my first thing, that was, man. Yeah, that was my first one. Yeah. I don't even know. Is it jw152 at, hot, at hotmail.com? Hell yeah, yeah, dude. Hell yeah, I remember it. You should that log was, in and see what, kind of, the see shit. what kind of message you got. I think there. I have, man. I think it's like. Yeah, I don't, it was a while ago. I don't get that bored, fortunately. Sometimes I do. Then I just sit around <laughs> and I go, it's good to be bored. Uh, uh, my days are bored and I'm drawing to a close. I still can't be ready to go back to work tomorrow, man. I gotta fucking go home and like do shit like I used to do, like pack lunches and food prep and all that kind of working man nonsense Yeah. that I haven't had to do for four months. Wow. That's right, dude. You're going to start your stick mobility and get your first client. Client zero. Client zero. That's right. You know, I, dude, I had a, when I was drinking the kettlebell Kool-Aid quite a bit back in the day, when I first moved here, 
I had a handful of people I was training out of my garage, and I didn't really have a garage gym. I just had a bunch of kettlebells, and we just work out on, on a patio or out in the driveway. And it's and when I was going through, when I found those old pictures of white belt Rob, I was going through a bunch of shit, getting rid of stuff the other day. And uh, I found some old notebooks from some of the clients I trained. Yeah. I had all the workouts written down and shit. It was kind of funny. Yeah, man. Yeah. I mean, you got a decent uh, setup in your garage. And hey, my garage is pretty sweet now. I'm pretty stoked yeah. in my little I actually got two uh, mats at the facility. At the, oh, like the, the, black, the big black mats? Yeah, they're just sitting in the storeroom if you want to oh, yeah, I'll take them. use them. I could use a couple more. So, but yeah. I mean, that's... You got, dude. You know a lot more about training than most people, and like to to me, like that's definitely one of your intersections. That's one of the 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 skills that you have, and you know, intersecting that with some other things is is you know personally where I think your your exit strategy would be, because uh, you know people respond to you. They like to come up and talk to you. I'm delightful. You're you're the delightful asshole. And, uh, yeah, so, anyways. Yeah, I know, I get all those weird fucking people coming up talking to me all the time. Yeah. I still don't know why Imagine I do. if you could charge money to talk to you. Yeah. That's all, being a trainer, dude, half <laughs> of being a trainer is just like, people want someone to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways. Just make them sweat a little bit while you're talking yeah, to Yeah, 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 that's it, yeah, man. Personal training you're sense. asking them about their weekend while you're fucking working them out, so, that's half of it. They just like to... Have someone to talk to. You. Women like to have a sexy dude to hang out with. He pays attention to them. I don't know if I feel that role, buddy. <laughs> Shit, are you kidding me, man? <laughs> dude, I'm I'm serious. I was like, when I was a trainer, I remember there was an article uh, that came out. One of my clients, um, it was a little uncomfortable when she brought it and pointed it out. I was like, what are you saying here? And uh, but it was basically an article saying that they had surveyed a, you know a bunch of women. It's probably in, like New York or LA area. But the, yeah, like the majority of them, one of the perks was, you know, having a good looking dude pay attention to them because back at home, they got some frumpy fat fuck who works all the time and doesn't pay any attention to them. And uh, so anyways, people just want to feel special. Hmm. <laughs> I don't know what to say. About that. <laughs> anyways, anyways, I'll save us. With, uh, did you see that Ben Askren got knocked the fuck out? Did you I see it? it? It's the flying knee. Yeah. yeah. Did you see it? Yeah. I, 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 I didn't watch it live, but I actually went on old Twitter. I ain't been on Twitter in forever. But that was the only spot I could find. The, I found uh, it on YouTube this morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Last night, I was trying to find it, and everything was just like the aftermath. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, I found it on Twitter. But yeah, dude, that was fucking nasty. Dude, Masvidal is a tough son of a bitch. He's been in the game a long time, man. And I knew that was going to be a good fight. Uh, it obviously wasn't a good fight. It ended so fast. I would have liked to see it actually be a fight. I mean, it was cool. It's a cool way it finished, man. That Fuck happens. yeah. That definitely fucking Man, happens. I got to tell you. I mean, you saw it. I mean, what was... Dude, what was that fucking shot, man? I, I think it was just reflex because bell rang... And you see, they both kind of took a couple steps out, and then Masvidal just ran at him. Yeah. And he really just sprinted and, yeah. he, and flew that knee. And I, Askren didn't even have time to... to Dude, he bent over. He bent over. He, he didn't even have... fucking half ass fucking... Sh- he was going for like some half ass shot. I, I, I don't know I, what I don't he even, was doing. I don't even... It wasn't... He wasn't initiating the action. It was just instinct. Like, somebody was flying... You had a dude across the cage... Sprinting at you and then jumping and flying to me, it was just he Dude. didn't even process. I know. His body just reacted and he got caught. And I, I like if there was, I, it looked. I, I was again. I'm talking about someone who's a professional. I understand this is uh, armchair quarterbacking at its finest here. But I'm like, okay, if I got someone running at me, probably the last thing that I want to do is bend over and put my arms out to the side. But, I mean, that's pretty much what he did. I, I know exactly what you're saying, and I don't disagree with you, but there wasn't even, the way you just explained it, that process never went through his head. It was strictly just a reaction. I guarantee if he wasn't a wrestler, that wouldn't have been his reaction. Yep, you're right. Because you If know, he was a striker, that wouldn't have been his that reaction. That would have been his reaction. Yep. So that, that's why I'm saying, like, yeah. his, his reaction was a shot. And it just... And, and, it, was, and it was kind of a... It was a 
kind of a fucking half-assed, like, reactionary shot. That's why I looked half-assed. It was like, but it's still, it was like, that's your reaction is a half-assed shot when this motherfucker comes flying at you from across the cage? Like, that, that's not, like, top tier UFC champion cage I, I, fighter I think it was just such a surprise. instincts it caught him so off guard I know man that it was just how many people have come flying in with a flying knee very to few. start the no, no to start a fight off how many people come running in with a flying knee very few you know John Jones did it when he like when he dude you see up. that shit all the time on the undercards and yeah, stuff I mean, but it's not it's not like uncommon it's not uncommon. it's not completely uncommon it's not like holy shit what the fuck? First time in fucking right. UFC history we've seen this move, folks. What on? Where did he come up with this crazy idea? Yeah, okay. On that, I see what you're saying there, yeah. Right? It's not like it hasn't happened. It's not like it hasn't happened. And how many people have been knocked out in five seconds because of it? Well, one. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and so, I mean, I'm just saying, dude. Like, there is... So, it makes me wonder, like, what it... I don't know, man. I think it exposed Askren. He got fucking lit up by Robbie Lawler. In that first five seconds. In that first five seconds. He got bombed on his head. Yes. He like he his stand up and his stand his reactions to stand up uh attacks don't fucking Honor. seem like they're on the level they need to be to they're be not banging saying, with not, dudes in the UFC, man. Yet, no. Man. Like Bellator and one FC were one thing. I I don't know if that's what we're seeing, is like he really ain't as good as we thought it was just the competition that he was going up against just was not uh, at the same level. But I mean, I feel like his last two fights have exposed him a little bit. Like I, I, I can see that. Yeah, because once he gets a hold of you, you're yeah. almost fucked. Yeah. But he he's been so reliant on that for so many years of his life. The other the other stuff, the other parts of the game, the distance management, the the stand up. It just it's not second nature yes. to him yet. If you're going in there against someone who's got really good striking, man, you need to be able to react like a striker. And I, like so, and then that's that just was crazy, dude. Dude, it was crazy. I just uh, knock out in UFC history. But I'm pretty sure prior to that, it was uh, Dwayne Ludwig. Yeah, like in like seven seconds. Yeah. I mean, and what? Oh, that's because Conor McGregor knocking out Jose Jose Aldo. That was like 13 seconds or something. Yeah, they had a little kind of yeah. back and forth, For and then second. yeah. Wow. And then popped yeah, them. Five seconds. That's so Jesus, crazy. Jesus, dude. Dude, he was out. Too. Yeah, he How was. stiff he was. Dude, he, he was like curled up and like, yeah. like a like a plank position kind of, you yeah. know, like a toe touch position. His one leg was like, he was knocked the fuck out. Dude, Masvidal sprinted so fast uh-huh. at him. Like, it was just like a fucking shot. Yep. Like, so too, again, man, I, I know exactly what you're saying. Like, he didn't have time to think, reaction, but... Again, everything I just said, but that guy came flying at him so fucking hard, throws his knee, and the guy bends over, not it. even, and fucking oh, opens his yeah. arms up. It was like, yeah, you he, he couldn't have scripted it any better. If you tell somebody, hey, you know, what do you want him to do to make sure that you knock him out with this first move? It'd be bend like, over, move his arms bend over and take his hands out of the way. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we'll do that. <laughs> That sucks. I wanted to see more of a scrap, but it is cool. I mean, I did. Yeah, it happens, man. It's a fight. What sucks to me is I was hoping that we were gonna get like that. Ben really was the Khabib, like the guy that we wanted to see against Khabib. So I don't see that. Like, just Khabib stand ups, fucking legit. And I mean, he fucking knocked Connor, like rung his bell, and so it's yeah. I don't know, man. He's, he's got a ways to go. You know what I mean? Like, he's got to climb up that ladder to even get there. Yeah, I think that's what the past two fights have shown us is that maybe it just he wasn't fine fighting the highest caliber of guys. Yeah, that, that ascent up the ladder isn't going to be quite as quick as we uh, had thought. You know, a that's few, few warm up. Man, I mean, tell me that when they traded, you think Dana's having any regrets about trading him for fucking Mighty Mouse? Yeah. Uh, you know, and, but, uh, but you, you can't tell me when, when that trade was made, everyone knew that why that trade was made, and that you were going to get a couple of warm up fights, but that him getting a title shot was in his future uh, pretty soon. And yes, we're going to give him a couple warm up fights because it's not fair to just bring him in and give him one right off the bat. But I mean, that was 
I agree. Yeah. I agree. And, and these last two fights have definitely thrown a monkey wrench in that whole uh, still so scene. Crazy. I don't like to say, Masvidal is a tough son of a bitch, man. Yeah. It's cool to see. So. Yeah. Dude, all those dudes are. That's what makes UFC, like MMA, so... Like, you know, man, when you see, you know... Uh, I mean, I guess, like, Deontay Wilder's probably the closest thing to that, like... You never quite know exactly what's going to happen. Uh, power. But... Yeah, man, like boxing, you know what you're going to get. Like, no one's going to come f- with some, you know, yeah, flying knee in five seconds or whatever. Just yes. bell rings and here I come, motherfucker. Oh, dude, yeah. So, that's pretty good. I didn't see the other... Uh, I, the checked John, the res- I checked the results, dude. I haven't seen any fights yet. I checked the results. Uh, John Jones won, I think, with the distance, man. Okay. If I, if I remember reading right. Um Nunez won. Yeah, I read she got a. I didn't see it, but I, I like head kicked her or something. I, I like I said, I haven't seen it. But yeah, who wasn't worth spending sixty bucks on? No, we had a birthday dinner last night. Anyway, that's so. right. That's right. We had Kiela's pre-birthday birthday dinner. She got some sweet chopsticks from you. Those are pretty sweet. This thing is fucking badass, <laughs> man. <laughs> you know, Dr. Sorrow chopsticks. Yeah, they like how they. Uh, I mean, how would you describe them? They got the little. Like, like travel two, chopsticks? Yeah, they're like two parts, so you unscrew them. The, the, the little part, the yeah. bottom little part fits inside of the big part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The top part's hollow, so you yeah. can unscrew the bottom half and fit it in. And yeah, that's sweet. And for, uh, you know, even though it is racially assumptive of you <laughs> to assume that a half Japanese girl uh, would like chopsticks, but um, she loves them. That's pretty. I've. I felt pretty safe making that assumption. Yes. I didn't see it being misconstrued as being uh, <laughs> race no. assumptive. No, no, no. It was a safe assumption. Yes. Yeah. No, man. She liked it. Those are awesome. I seen her. I seen her eating the kimchi that I made with chopsticks. So. Yeah. Was like, That's gonna be the place. She's gonna be using your chopsticks that you bought her to eat the kimchi that you made her. Yep. Yeah, man. It's nice. I got another big ass batch of kimchi going. It's good for you, brother. <laughs> good for you. As long as you know, keep be, it outside. I know you'd be pumped for me to bring a jar over. Keep it outside. Um, did you see that Keenan starting his own gym? Did we talk I about see, this? Uh, I, saw, I haven't looked into it. I've seen he was starting his own team. Is yeah. He started, he's opening up a gym. I, yeah, 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 yeah. From my understanding. Based What's he called? Like Legion or something? Or? Something like that, yeah. <laughs> In the San Diego area. I'm like, that's all San Diego needs. Is another <laughs> fucking world class jujitsu. Uh, they got, studio. They got the bodies to fill it, man. I'm sure he won't have any problem getting students. No, 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 no. I will be very interested, though, to see how his attitude and tune uh, and everything changes, if at all, having to be on the other side yep. of it. And now you own the team, you run the team, and, you know, he made a statement about, like, you know, if it, it's going to be kind of like BJJ Globetrotters where it's if you need to compete you want to compete and you don't have an ibjjf affiliation uh you can just contact him and he'll uh put you in under them so you can he just has it open for people to compete uh under it like that I and mean, that's what bjj mm-hmm. globetrotters does right for the most yeah. part yeah. and so you know and he's like oh you know just anybody that needs to blah 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 and but it's it's funny like i don't know if you remember the uh um, there was some shit with uh, Tex Johnson recently, and that he had there was some like sexual assault allegations yeah. or something. Yeah, right after he tapped Free Big Opinion. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah. he kind of bowed out for a little bit. And he even put out a statement that he was going to like rehab. Yeah, going to rehab. So he had some drug rehab, and then had that, and like, so he tried to compete. He was going to compete. Uh, forget where, um, and he was going to do it under the BJJ Globetrotters, and reached out to them, and they were like no you know like no offense but like we aren't you know you're under investigation for this you know no offense but like we're not really we're not putting our name on yeah we're not gonna let you someone who's he's being investigated for sexual assault compete under our banner so he actually went to san diego i think he got under like the hibero uh yeah 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 i think that's who he ended up like competing under um over it but you know, just situations like that. Like, it's easy to say that, but what happens first time someone contacts you and it is. It's like, dude, I don't want this person representing me and my brand. 
And so now you're the guy on the other side having to like make this judgment call and decide like, well, this is okay and this isn't or, or whatever. So I think it's, it's, uh, it's good. Keenan's a really smart guy. And, uh, you know, I think that there was definitely some, you know, some personality issues and stuff that were going on there, uh, at Atos, but, you know, I, I will be curious to see if how he his mindset and just what his you know what he has to say about running things on the other side once he tries to run them yeah 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 it's like it's gonna shift his perspective yeah it's like oh wait a minute people don't always pay their bills on time i'm gonna have to come after joe and remind joe to pay his dues dues, and then people are just gonna try to bow out after like six months when i signed up for a year like what do i do with that you know like those are decisions that you have to make like am i really gonna send them to collections am i just gonna let it go like what am i gonna do and uh but yeah it's a lot easier to just be the athlete showing up and looking around going like dude if i was running this place this is what i'd be doing I'd be doing it this way. You know, I'd be doing it that way. Yeah, but it's so easy to sit back and say that, but when it's actually your name <laughs> on it and it's affecting your well-being yep. and your income, yeah, yeah. Your perspective shifts. And he's going to have to be, now he's going to have to run a business. You know, and again, he's a super, like, he strikes me as a really smart guy. I just listen, listening to him talk, looking at his, I mean, the success that he's had with his online thing so far. I mean, he's obviously not an idiot. Right. And so, um, yeah, like his, uh, um, him thinking about being a business owner now, it's like the e-myth, right? Like most businesses aren't started by entrepreneurs or started by technicians, people who are good at a job who start a business to give themselves a job because they think that that's going to be better than working for someone else. That's not the same thing as starting a business. And so, uh, again, it'd be interesting to see, like, does he fall into the trap of the, the e-myth? You know, does he really like become an entrepreneur and and like run a business, or is he just like a jujitsu guy who has a gym? Who, you know, I mean, we know how there's there's levels. There's definitely definitely levels to how you run a business, and uh, so, anyways, I I don't know why. I just it'd be interesting. I think it'd be interesting to see because he's such a like icon for free spirit jujitsu. (laughs) <laughs> it's like all right now you, you bought yourself a fucking job buddy yep so we'll see how your uh if anything your changes your spirit mentality changes yeah unfortunately it's like that uh you know if you're not a fucking rebel in the 20 you've got no heart but if you haven't turned establishment by 30 you ain't got no brains yep. it's like unfortunately man there's just the way the world fucking works and you either figure it out or you rage against the machine and uh so anyways oh and uh speaking of which i sent uh him keenan and josh some unsolicited advice for their podcast did you i did <laughs> how, did, how, did you, how did you send this to him i couldn't help myself comment man. on the youtube or something or? no I, i've got their i got the hanger bjj gmail email address off uh-huh. of the, uh hanger's facebook um thing and so again i don't it is, it, I just it was one of those things every once in a while I got to do things right like I send things out in the universe because you never quite know exactly what may happen and 99 plus percent of the time nothing happens but every once in a while something weird comes about like if I hadn't you know reached out and you know, I can point to all sorts of shit where it's kind like, like Hotel Jesus standing yes. up on the bus saying I'm on the bus with 50 cents exactly sometimes it makes no sense but you got an instinct that tells you to do it. You fucking do it and just see what happens, man. I don't know. But I, it just, I saw him, them, uh, with the Matt Byrne podcast making the same mistake that everyone fucking makes and they're not building their email list. And they're just focusing on building Facebook and YouTube and Instagram likes and follows and subscribes and they have no email list. And so I was just saying, hey, man, just some... Friendly advice from someone who's done this for a little bit that, uh, like, you don't own those fucking platforms, man. Like, they own those platforms. So, like, you can't, you can't communicate directly with the people who are following you because algorithms decide whether they're going to see it. And you could be deplatformed at any time for some fucking reason. You know, you offend someone or something. So, you don't own those platforms. 
So it's like that Hotep Jesus was saying, man, you got to build your own platform. You got to own your platform if you want to do this the right way. And that's an email list. So I just said, man, something simple like podcast updates and the top five hanger team mistakes and how to fix them. We get you going, brother. So it's like, I'm not selling nothing. Just fan of your work. I told him you might remember me as your Uki for the second half of the Salt Lake seminar. And uh, so, yeah. Have you heard back yet? Nothing. No, I don't expect to, but you never know. Or you got blocked. Maybe he'll just block you from all this shit. I know, I'm spam. I titled it. I titled the email, uh, Some Unsolicited Advice for Your Podcast. <laughs> did you? Yeah, I did. Yes. I was like... If somebody sent me something like that, I would, I would open it for sure. I'd be like, all right, I got I to gotta see what this guy has to say. What's this saying? fucking joker saying? <laughs> but the thing is, is I don't know... Uh, God, I, I could have tried to send it through like a message, but... Um, like DMing him uh, through That's Instagram or pain in the ass. Weird. Yeah, and especially for something like that. Like, you know, because it's a few paragraphs that I'm trying to communicate to him. It's like a real thought that has some layers and depth. It's not like, hey, bro, love your shit. I can help you. Yeah. Here's my program. Here's my program. Check out, yeah. And it's it's yeah. only forty nine ninety five. So, just some unsolicited advice to the. That's hilarious. I have yet to listen to their podcast. Oh really? No. Yeah, they finally I've seen little clips of it, but yeah, they got it on uh, some other. I haven't been able to find it, but they say they're on like Podbean and some of these other. Because at uh, first they were just on YouTube, just on right? YouTube. So yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to download it. I'd like to listen to it. Yeah, you can't unless you have a YouTube Premium membership. You can't download stuff. No, yeah, and you, and you can't close the phone. Like, you yeah, have to keep your screen up. Keep it up. To right. play. So, it's not like listen to a podcast in your car. Right. I mean, you can, but it's just not quite the same. So, we'll figure it out. But, uh, yeah, I figured given the success of this podcast that I would <laughs> offer some... Being that we're, we're so successful. ...advice to, you know, Josh and, and Keenan because they might need some help building their audience, you know. I don't know if anybody's heard of these guys. They're pretty good. So I remind you, I'll never forget. I don't know if you remember this guy. His name is Jens Pulver. Oh yeah. Old, old US, Little Evil. Little Evil, right? Yep. You know, one of the early days, you you know, I'm a May guy. And he was from the Midwest somewhere. And I'll never forget. We were I was at a I think it was a Naga tournament, me and a group of my buddies. We were all white belts, blue belts at the time. And Jens had a, a super fight match at some point during the tournament. I can't remember who he was going against. And so we're all sitting around the match wa- mat watching. And uh, I think, if I remember right, Jens had his opponent and tr- was trying to finish a triangle. And my buddy, who is a white belt like me, is yelling out advice to Jens Pulver on the side of the mat <laughs> on how to finish the triangle. And we're all like... You know, six months, a year, year and a half into jiu-jitsu at best. And he's he was coaching Jens from the sidelines. That was definitely some unsolicited advice. That is pretty funny. <laughs> he was yelling it. And then me Finish and the, the triangle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got yeah. And I remember me and, me and a couple of other boys looked at him like, what in the fuck are you doing? Just shut up. Shut You're up. You're making us look bad. That's funny, man. Dude, yeah. I remember him from one of the first few seasons of The Ultimate Fighter. Him and BJ Penn were oh, yeah. coaches. Remember that? Yep. Yeah. They fucking... That was funny, man. Like, the show, I, I, if they were just playing it up, man, they looked like they were... Like, BJ did not like Jens. And Jens knew how to get under BJ's skin. I just forgot all about that. And, yeah, dude, he got BJ pretty fucking pissed off a few times. I remember, I think he beat him in, like, like the bowling. Because remember, they, they would have, like, at the, they'd have the, the coaches challenges, challenge. Yeah. It's like you know, hundred grand or whatever cash to the coach that wins the for the whole team or whatever it was, and and uh, that, that wins like bowling or table tennis or some shit like that. And I remember whatever the challenge was, Jens was beating him, and he was almost like you could tell he was almost feeling like bad about how fucking bad BJ was feeling about it because dude, BJ is a super competitive motherfucker. Like you know, coming from Hawaii and just that area, and he's like. You Did know. you see just recently he got into a fight with some bouncer yeah, outside of a strip club? Dude, I know. That's the unfortunate thing, dude. Is, like, come on, man. Well, What's see, going on here? dude, living in Hawaii, though, is like... Cause that's where he's at, right? That's right. where it was. Yep. 
it's like that's probably the worst spot for him to be. I mean, that was that was his that was kind of his downfall on some level. Because you remember, like when he was training with the Marinoviches, and he was that was the best he ever that looked. was the best he ever looked, man. And then he he went back home and he started training back home and it's like back home is comfortable. Back home you've got people around you who accommodate your stuff and and uh, so man, unfortunately that's I I just I see that like when I see BJ, I'm like man that is you know as good as he was and as good as he still is and as much respect as he deserves like he's kind of a fucking cautionary tale at this point. Yep. Like, he went from being, like, one of the greatest, the prodigy, like, one of the, you know, youngest BJJ black belts and, like, world champion at fucking super young age and UFC champion and all this shit to, like, setting the record for the most losses in a row in the UFC and, you know, getting caught on film fighting bouncers at a strip, strip club. It's like, dude, how? That is, that's a long way to fall. Like, yeah. that doesn't happen just by chance like there's decisions made along the several way bad decisions several along bad there. decisions along the way that have added up to this so but uh yeah sometimes the people you're hanging out with man they may have the best intentions for you but not with the best people to be hanging out with yeah yeah road to hell is paved with bad intentions <laughs> yeah is it, is it paved with good intentions good not, intentions not that's right goes. no it is you're right Turns out to be bad, but unknowingly. So, unfortunately, that's right, man. That's right. Fuck else do I got here? I got I got two bro science things that you're gonna find interesting. You came in super prepared. A little bit. You. Well, we didn't even come up with a topic. I came up with a topic for us. We're gonna talk about why CrossFit cardio sucks. So. Okay, why does it suck? Well, we'll talk about that later. Okay. That's our topic. Oh, we can't get into our topic until at least like an hour and a half in. We're almost there. Are we? Yeah. Okay, cool. This will get us there. Over <laughs> the hump. So, one study I, I found looked at low back pain among BJJ practitioners. Uh -huh. So, uh, 72 athletes, the average age was 26.7, basically 27 years old. Yeah. Okay, 72 athletes, um, 36 being recreational and 36 being professional. Chronic low back pain was present in 80.6% of the athletes. God, dude, I bet you, you just think the general population, the low back pain is like 80%. Yeah. If you just go walk around and ask 100 people, I bet you 80, it is. Of, I bet you 80 of them are going to be like, yeah. oh yeah, my low back hurts almost daily. That's definitely reflective of, yeah. of population norms. But they did find that uh, it was almost 89% in the professional uh, jiu-jitsu athletes and like 72% in the recreational so there was a, a, a definitely a difference like a difference the there. yeah the professionals definitely had a higher rate um, of that but it uh, yeah that was their conclusion the prevalence of low back pain in jiu-jitsu is high and professional athletes seem to have a high risk of developing chronic low back pain hmm. any thoughts I don't know, there's so many... Again, it just it carries over to the general population people, too. Um, I don't know, I mean, it's a tough sport. Yeah. And if you don't... Just like I, I talked about earlier in this podcast, you know, your training should try to balance out the repetitive shit you do to keep your body up in your sport. And if you don't concentrate on mobility and flexibility and recovery, man, you're going to fuck... Your back's going to hurt. You know what's interesting though? Here's what kind of was interesting to me too was if you're okay, let's say you're a professional jujitsu athlete. Would you say that most professional jujitsu athletes at least have like reasonable flexibility, mobility, like ability? Yeah. So you know what I mean? Like they're higher than average, right? Like higher than the average population. Like they're gonna have a higher degree of, of flexibility and mobility. But the low back pain is still the same. Hmm. So, like, you know, that was kind of the thing to me is like, you know, like it's on some level, there's more to it than just like mobility is part of it. Maybe it's doing wrong mobility. Like maybe you're doing mobility, but you're not doing the right kind of mobility. But the ability to be flexible and mobile on the mats does not equal the ability to move around pain free. Yeah, true. And so, 
you know, I think that's where most people would look at jujitsu athletes and assume like they're so fucking flexible that they're not going to suffer from low back pain the same way as uh, the general population will. Because again, like shoulder injuries, groin, you know, things like that. Like, I mean, really, like your, uh, you know, the so. Anyways, that was kind of my what I found kind of interesting when I thought about it. Yeah, I guess because you know my initial response, if we're talking about general population, is just due to inactivity and shit mobility and flexibility. But then you take a professional jiu-jitsu athlete; they're not an active; they're a, you know highly active person, mm-hmm. physical, physically wise, and yeah, they're above average mobility and flexibility for the most part. But they still got lower back pain, and then I think that just goes into the overuse category. Yeah, and just using the shit out of it. Yeah, yeah. And constantly trying to keep posture. Well, if you remember too, we talked about a study where they used the functional movement screen to look at the athletes, and they found that they consistently scored pretty poor, and that again, there's a correlation between uh, a poor functional movement score and potential chance of injury. So, you know, again, it's like the, um, like movement quality, that ability to strip back. Cause you know, again, not to call you out on, you know, international podcasts here to our hundreds of fans, but when we did your functional movement screen, it was not good, man. And that's something I was going to talk to you about here soon is like, when you get back to training, like when your knee is a go. And, and they're like, okay, you don't need to protect the knee anymore. Like, man, honestly, like, I think working with you to get that functional movement screen up to a passing score, which is basically a two on everything with no asymmetries, um, should be the priority so that you make sure, like... Prevent injury. You, you, you just, it, it took, you know, again, man, the, the fucking stats are there. Like, a poor functional movement screen, there's an increased risk of injury. And for someone who's already had two ACL surgeries... Like just doing everything that you can to tip the odds in your favor to not get hurt. And a lot of that is that movement quality. So like, again, like you're pretty mobile, you're pretty flexible, but your functional movement screen is off. So again, it's like there's, there's a little bit more to it than just mobility. There's, there's a movement quality aspect that has to be addressed because it's that, 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 that core movement quality that um, leads to the injuries and mobility is a part of it. But, you know, anyways, I just kind of thought like that study and the other one and stuff, like kind of connecting a few thoughts. Well, in my you head. put it like that helps solidify in my head. Like, it does, it does make sense. You know, having a shitty functional movement screen score, uh, the correlation between that and the injury is probably pretty goddamn high. Yeah. And again, I'm I'm on ACL surgery number two. Yeah. So it's there's a there's definitely a problem. Yeah. That I need to address. And that would be like, and that's really kind of what the functional movement screen, especially for athletes like you coming back from an injury, was to okay, like you know when Jenna signs off and says, or you know your doctors and Vale sign off and they say like, okay, you're good to go back to training. You know, that's like that knee is good to go back that to tendon. training. That tendon is good that's to go all back to training. Saying. That's all they're saying, right? And so at that point, it becomes like, all right, now I got to make sure that my movement quality is where it needs to be so that I'm not putting any extra strain on this tendon. And so instead of just jumping right into kind of performance training, and that's a mistake that a lot of people make is they skip that that gap between the you know the functional rehab or whatever you want to call it. It's like they, they rehab the injury and then they jump back into training without that kind of uh filling in that gap between the the two um the two things so anyways that's a good point we'll work on the project we'll call it the fucking rob eikoff project sounds good to me yeah i can run me through a functional we should probably do it pretty soon kind of see where i'm at yeah see where i'm at now and yeah we'll see anytime you have some sort of restrictions and we know the restrictions are there then it kind of throws the whole data set out because you're just moving to protect the knee, right? Like, so like, like, like pain and uh, restriction of, of movement because of the, the surgery, your brain is going to be coming up with um, strategies to compensate. to compensate for that. Yeah, see, but I don't think, like, remember, I mean, I'm not, 
I'm aware of the functional movement screen test, but I don't have it like memorized. Mm -hmm. But I can't think of anything in there that would be dangerous for me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, that I would be restricted from doing. It's mm -hmm. all really safe moves. And, not, and nothing, nothing that I would even consider suspect to where my I, I don't think my body would get into like a protective mode or yeah. com a compensation mode. Yeah, yeah. I would think. Yeah, I mean, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, you see, I don't know if I expressed my thought until. No, I know, I know what you're saying, but it's just it's hard because we're such a poor. Um, it's like with sleep, like we're the worst. You know, we don't know if we don't have enough sleep, right? Like it's just it's such, it's not a conscious thing, and so right. that's the whole thing. Like movement compensations are just that. Like they're not a conscious thing; they're totally subconscious. So of course you don't feel like it hurts <laughs> when you move. Because you have some way of moving that doesn't hurt. doesn't hurt. And so, uh, you know, when you're, and, and that's, like I said, when you're cleared and we know that like, okay, the tendon is where it needs to be so that you can move the way that you need to. Now we need to look at it and see what's going on and then, uh, you know, go from there. Because yeah, man, like right now, like I, I watch you move, you still... You still protect that thing a little bit. Do I? Yeah. Subconsciously, I'm sure I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you, and you've even said, like, you can't sit back on it the same. Like, there's just, you can't put weight on it the same. There's just, there's a couple things that you can't do the same as the other knee. And so, your brain knows that. And it is, it, it, it's protecting it in, in subtle ways that you're not always aware of. So, that's why, like, right now, your whole thing is just, you're doing the right thing rehab that knee right like just don't do anything to fuck with it just kind of keep things going and then when you get the green light like okay man your knee's good to go or past that acute rehab stage you can start training again and it's like all right now we need to make sure we're getting everything lined up before you start fucking hammering the gas real hard like that's the that's the idea behind it so that makes sense. Yeah. It seems like an intelligent approach yeah because you're not I'm, you're not hammering the gas you no. know what i mean you know, you're still taking care of that knee so it's uh, you're you're yeah it's uh anyways, anyways. so Good thought. okay I got one more bro science for you sweet the title of the study was faces of glory the left cheek posing biased for medalists of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu competitions <laughs> okay <laughs> who who did this study oh I didn't see who did it uh it doesn't matter. Um, the study uh, says that laboratory studies have shown that people tend to show the left side of their face when asked to broadly express emotions, while they tend to show the right side when asked to hide emotions. And so to test this theory, they went and found a bunch of pictures of people getting their medals at Brazilian Jiu Jitsu competitions and checked to see which side of their face they were biasing as they were expressing their emotion, getting their medal. And uh, lo and behold, it held up that the left cheek bias for expressing emotion held up when checking out medalists at BJJ competitions. And so when someone has a tendency to show you the right side of the face and trying to hide emotion? Yes. Yeah. If you're like sad and, and you have to like hide that you're sad, then or mad or whatever and you have to hide it then you'll tend to like Show the turn to the right and well you notice I'm slightly turned to the right right now because you were just dogging my fucking functional movement see so I'm, I'm masking my anger and my, my disdain was, for you right now I started thinking about that I'm like man I always turn my right side <laughs> again this must be why people don't talk to me we've been talking about like how no that's if you always turn your right side that's why people talk to you is because you're hiding your disgust for them well, right. no, 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 but they can tell. Like, subconsciously, we know, like, someone, you know what I mean? Like, I, I would think that humans think pick up on these subtle cues. We, we, we know these things. There's tales. Uh, I See, I'm looking at it the other way. Okay. I'm thinking I get too much unsolicited conversation in public is because I'm showing my right side to people more and I'm hiding my disgust from them. Uh. They don't know by me showing my right side to them, I'm masking my disgust. Oh. Uh. You see what I'm saying? I if, see it. If I was to show my left side, they could see that I have absolutely zero fucking desire to interact with them. Well, I think you are showing your left side, and it's inviting. 
<laughs> so, I disagree. I respectfully disagree. I'm gonna, I'm gonna fucking follow you around secretly, and we're gonna see when you're interacting with people, which side of your face do you bias? So <laughs> that'll be the next study. Yes, the, the FedEx driver bias, faces of delivery. Faces of delivery. I was looking through. I'm like, faces of glory. You know what I mean? I read this title, and I'm like. I had to read it like two or three times to like, what am I reading here? Then I click on the study and I'm like, oh my God, this is insane. Somebody got money to do that. That's, that's crazy. That shit is not free. Who paid them to do that? I don't know, man. They got a grant. They went and submitted money and or submitted for a grant. I mean, unless somebody just had the money. But yeah, then you got to go through the, the yeah, process we of can, We can put out papers. a quote unquote study and say that. And we can go look at five fucking pictures of people getting medals. You know, we don't have to state how many we looked. We can just... Well, I mean, in the... in the, in the the I was just looking at the abstract. I'm sure in the they got, full... They broke it down more. Yeah, they broke it down quite a Maybe bit Maybe that's more. a new segment we need to do on our podcast is the Grumpy Guy Studies. Yeah. But how's that different than bro science? It's not. Yeah. Yeah. Looking at the studies is interesting, man. Sometimes you got to do that. Like, it is... It's the conclusions... They massage the conclusions a lot of times because they know that their conclusion, if it matches up with what the people reading it already think and want to hear, then the odds of it getting passed along and approved and, and uh, you know going to a journal or whatever are higher. And so you'd be shocked at how many times you know you're reading the study. And then you look at the fucking conclusion and you're like, wait a minute, that is not what the fucking study said. Like either they're kind of like, you know, fudging a little bit or they, they throw in a little wording that's like, it's just, it's, uh, it's fucked up. So anyways, I still like to look through the abstracts because it's hard to read through the whole thing. It is. So. I just need the bullet points. Exactly, man. Exactly. Give me the bullet points. So... There you go. There's our uh, our bro science. Sweet. Low back pain and left cheek bias. <laughs> so, sure, they're connected somehow. They probably are. I'm sh- yeah. If yeah, yeah. If someone's got low back pain and they're hiding it, they're probably just showing to the right, right side. Yep. Yeah. Ooh. God, I wonder. I'm gonna start thinking about this when I'm rolling with people. I'm gonna be looking at them, Super seeing which side of their face they're biasing, and what does it say about them? So. We open up a whole new, whole new can of worms. Whole there. new can of worms. So, all right, that's all I got there. We got our cardio training thing here. Oh, what was it? Why does cross so, cardio suck? So, nah, like this, I, I got, I need more. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this came up. This was actually something I talked about on my uh, the Bike James podcast um, because uh, somebody had written an article. They call it mixed cardio. Right, because CrossFit can sometimes be a little bit of a dirty word, but mixed cardio is basically where you take a bunch of shit that's supposed to be like strength training, and mix it all together and call it cardio training. So, well, I mean, back up a little bit. You mix in stuff, so it's like, you know, you, you could be on the bike or the rower, and then you're doing like jumping split squats, and then you're doing like med ball tosses, and then you're, you know, so it's like these different exercises. Back in the day, we just call it circuit training, mm-hmm. right? And so, uh, and a lot of times, um, exercises that aren't necessarily appropriate for cardio training are picked. Um, and you know, I, I personally think like even something like pushups aren't something, unless you're a goddamn world champion pushup person. Pushupper. Uh, yeah, pushupper. Pushups are probably not a really good cardio exercise. Like if you're doing some sort of like mixed circuit uh, I'd even say like fucking push-ups would be pushing it for uh for most people. But um, so anyway, so it's the it's the type of workouts, the type of cardio strength training that CrossFit popularized. You know, it, like I said, it's been around forever. It's just basically circuit training, high intensity interval training. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's got all these name you want to put on these it. different names, man. But like I said, it's but that's what it is. And so sometimes uh. Like I said, I saw it being called mixed cardio, um, where you're mixing these different modalities together. And so, you know, you see it. It's like, you know, we're doing battle ropes, and then we're doing fucking kettlebell snatches, and then we're doing hit in the bag, and then we're doing fucking bodyweight squats. I, you know, whatever. It's just, I'd say, like, for most people, um, 
you know, if you think about like cardio training for jujitsu and, and MMA, like that mixed cardio uh, comes to mind. And it's like, it's, uh, you know, just like work hard and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so the, um, so anyways, the, the, my, my point with it was that that type of cardio is, it's harder to simulate, like you can if you do it right, but you have to always be thinking about like cardio has specific um, energy system demands. You know, we've talked about like a five minute match versus a 10 minute match. Like that's a completely different f f metabolic uh, pacing strategies, energy system demands, all these things are completely different. And so now, and then are we doing gi or no gi? Are we doing points or submission only? You know, like, so, so it all, changes it, drastically. it changes it, right. And so, you know, your ability to, uh, what you want to do is to try to simulate those demands as much as possible. Now, one, we're lucky because we play a sport that we get to actually do the sport. Right now, what's what's the most specific type of training you can do for jujitsu? Jujitsu, jujitsu, or like you know, jujitsu drills, or there are things where you're actually doing jujitsu movements and stuff. And so, you can use that as specific type of cardio training. And then, you know, something else I've you know talked about, like you know, we were talking about with mobility, like you're trying to undo what you're already doing with your sport, and so. If you're already getting a bunch of cardio training when you roll, the you last thing you don't training. need to be doing a bunch of cardio training. And so, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know why, like I said, I was. Just, it really wasn't a subject for us as much as like a little side rant for me because just every once in a while, man, I, I you know, peek my head around and look and it's just like, you know, dude, just because you're working hard doesn't mean that you're uh, improving your you know, your specific cardio for what you're doing. And so it's like having some sort of fucking plan. You need to have a plan. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think a lot of people make that mistake though. You know, just because they're working hard and getting a sweat going doesn't necessarily mean you're progressing. Yeah. You need, yeah. If, yeah. You get, you should have a plan and uh, periodizing your training. Yeah. And understand having a goal and of, okay, I'm going to do this for six weeks. I'm going to, okay, I'm going to do this for the next eight weeks or four weeks, whatever it is. But, Picking a plan, picking a desired outcome, shooting for it, sticking to it, and then moving on to the next one. And yeah, and if you're getting a lot, if you're doing, if you're training a lot of jiu-jitsu, you don't need to be doing a ton of cardio outside of that. Right. You should be trying to undo the damage that you're doing through jiu-jitsu or, you know, strength training outside of that. And so yeah, I agree. Yeah. But it's yeah. it's easy to fall into that trap. It is, man. It's super easy to fall into it's that trap. It's easy. You get done rolling and you're like, dude, I'm hot and sweaty and breathing hard when I roll, so therefore I need to get hot and sweaty and breathe hard when I work out. Exactly. otherwise it's not specific to what I'm doing. But God, what I was talking about this the other day with uh you know, the idea is you want a strength and conditioning program. Mm -hmm. And and conditioning is about it's specific to the sport. It's why it's not cardio. Like cardio is just kind of this general like cardiovascular fitness. Like conditioning is just, it, it's just that. You are being conditioned to train BJJ. You're conditioning an athlete to play football. You're, there, there are specific things that they have to do to condition their mind and their body and their, their metabolic system and all these things to play these sports. And they're specific to the sport, right? And so the... Um, what you end up with though, when you do a lot of that mixed cardio stuff, you end up with what I call a, a, a weakness and and fucking cardio program. You know, like you know, you're you're not getting stronger. There's no way you can get stronger when you're focusing a lot on that mixed cardio type training. Like you have to really focus on getting stronger to get stronger. And so you're not getting stronger, so you're getting weaker, and you're not working on your specific conditioning for your sport. You're just doing shit. You're working on your cardio. Like your general cardio fitness, which is not what you want. So you end up with a fucking weakness and cardio program instead of a strength and conditioning program. And uh, yeah, it's 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 unfortunate. People waste a lot of time on that stuff. It leads to frustration. So yeah, if you're if you're doing jujitsu, man, like CrossFit and CrossFit type workouts and and cardio is 
really, in my opinion, the last thing that you need to be doing. Yeah, it's super uh, detrimental to long term progress in jujitsu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You need. To it, be- it took me a lot of years to figure that out. I was, I, I tried to do both for quite a while, and, I, and finally I was like, "What? Am I? I don't know what it was, but finally I'm like, what am I doing? Like, I, I, I can't." I remember when we first met. That you were still doing CrossFit. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. I remember you actually came to me when you were trying to like figure out something else to yeah. do. And you're like, I just need some other ideas for doing shit, man, because like CrossFit's killing me. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, yeah, I remember, remember when you made that decision. But uh, yeah, it is. It's easy to make that mistake, and it's. Um, but yeah, if you're, yeah, what the fuck else was I? I think that was like my my point. Well, that's the the one of the things in in you know training and strength and conditioning looking at physical qualities and the specificity to the sport. So like flexibility, for example, it doesn't have to be super specific to your sport, right? Like a hamstring stretch that helps a jujitsu guy is going to help a mountain biker is going to help a general population guy. Like flexibility can be really general. You know, you start getting into strength, strength will get a little bit more specific, but it still can be pretty general, right? Like getting stronger in your general lifts, you know, we're not doing a whole lot of BJJ specific positions with our ramping isometrics, you know, they're pretty general. You know, we have a couple of specific things we throw in with, uh, but for the most part, it's pretty general. Now, power, where you're you're trying to move with more speed, now that becomes more of a timing element. Now, now you're starting to get more specific. So, like power that you develop doing one thing may not necessarily transfer over as well to BJJ. Like you got to make sure that the power that you're developing is is being done in the the right context so like this is why something like you know um <clears throat> i think that uh hip thrusts are better for training hip power than power cleans for a jiu-jitsu athlete because the yeah you're the the power cleans are just not very specific to what you do on the mats whereas like a, a banded hip thrust is and so but that's where you would get more specific and then finally you got your conditioning you got your cardio training and that's the most specific like that's why like what's going to be good for a you know even like what's going to be good for an mma fighter is not what's going to be best for a jujitsu uh athlete like even something as closely related as that they're still totally different sports from a conditioning uh standpoint and so like boxing is different than kickboxing kickboxing is different than mma You, you know and so taking if you're a, a kickboxer and you're trying to use a workout to condition for boxing like it's you're going to be missing shit you, you have to use a conditioning program specific to your sport and that's again it gets back to you know cardio you know metabolic demands and pacing strategies and shit because that's really what you're developing and so but that's you know just keep that in mind when you're thinking about your training program for jiu-jitsu like you can do general stretching. You can do general strength training. You get a little bit more specific with your power. But man, when you're doing your cardio, like you need to be making sure it's as specific as you can get. You know, and obviously there's if you want, you know, like an off season or you're just kind of building some general conditioning and you want to do that shit for fun, that's fine. But when you're really trying to improve your fitness and conditioning for jujitsu, it's got to be very specific to jujitsu, which means it's wrestle doing jujitsu. Doing jujitsu. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wrestle and drill. Yep. Yeah. So, anyways, that's why, like, when people ask me, like, what do you do, um, you know, outside of jiu-jitsu? And I always laugh and I'd say, man, you'd fucking hate me if I told you. Like, I really do not do a lot of strength training stuff. Like, outside of the isometrics and, you know, like, real hardcore strength training. And, like, you know, I know you're training real hard now because you can't roll. Because I can't roll, so. Right. But when you get back to rolling. I won't be it'd be going back the same way. It's like people look at us and, and they really knew how much training, strength training shit we did, strength and cardio shit we did outside of jiu-jitsu. I mean, the vast majority of what we're doing is recovery. Yeah. Mobility and recovery stuff. And then so we can get in there and roll. And yeah, because you don't want to take away from your time to roll. Yeah. You don't want to be so beat up from your conditioning or strength program that it affects your mat time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's another thing with a lot those mixed cardio programs. Is they really tend to leave you beat up and oh, feeling yeah, pretty dude. sore. They feel you, you feel real sore, and then you just you can't wrestle right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's probably the biggest drawback to those kind of cardio programs is they just you know or workouts they just they leave you too so fucking taxing, beat up, man. man. Yeah, but that's the point because a lot of times 
I don't know, CrossFit is a sport at this point. Yeah, but if that's all you do, then that's fine. Yeah. But if you're training for another sport, that's not... Yeah, if your sport is to fucking finish those circuits and do it as fast as you can, then great. But, yeah, that's not going to help you on the mats as much. But I still, you know, I agree with you 100%. But Pete, as with anything, people take it too far the other way. You get the people that are anti-strength and conditioning. Right. Like, oh, I don't need to do any of that shit. I'm just going to yeah. do jiu-jitsu. See, we do, right? That's the thing, though. We do do strength and conditioning. Right. It's just we do way less than what people probably assume that we do. And and the reason for that is like, well, this is the balance, right, that we have to maintain. Like, to do jiu-jitsu, that's the most physically taxing thing, but that's also the most specific thing. So it has to be the priority. And then everything else has to fit in around that. And we have figured out, like, how much can we do to get the results or to just maintain really at this point, like I'm not like it's fucking 43, man. I'm just, I'm not trying to improve my strength and conditioning to a large degree. Like I'm just happy where I'm at. just want to be able to train hard, uh, into the fucking into the sunset there. But, uh, you know, so you figure out like, what can you do to get what you need without interfering with jujitsu? And like that's always the ultimate test, man. Is it's like, is it interfering with your ability to train jujitsu? And if it is, is it really benefiting your jujitsu? Yeah. So, yeah. Anyways, that's good. It's a good point. Yeah, I think it's a good place to end. I think so too. I don't need to muddy up the water or anything. No, just call that good. All right, we'll leave it at there. So, and all right, man. Well, I guess uh, have call fun right. at work tomorrow. Fuck. And uh, <laughs> we'll get a we'll get a fucking recap of your first. First week week back, back at work. See if I've lost my shit by the time we talk next weekend. I'm really kind of curious to see what kind of stories we got. <laughs> oh, dude. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? All right. All right. See you. Thank you for listening to the Grumpy Guy BJJ podcast. Thank you all for listening. You can find us on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Please make sure to subscribe and leave us a review. It really does help and will allow us to keep putting out episodes. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas, hit us up at grumpyguybjj at gmail.com. Also, go to our website, grumpyguybjj.com, and get signed up for podcast updates and get our free BJJ Improvement Starter Kit. That's it for now, so get on the mat, train hard, and talk to you all next week. Froggy school, froggy cool, got a froggy outside my lady dude Now they're calling Daisy Duke, hanging by the lace of their shoes what? No trace of the tools, shaped in your face, fuck the rules Snooze you lose, one eye always open, it times two No clue, but soon a brief fun suit, might give you a view to choose Stay tuned, include, won't conclude To the end is near be where there's consequences, but what you do To me you demon, the devil of many levels, I keep on beating Several of them rebels, me, myself, he died. Me, myself, he died.